Father, once again, we come to your throne and ask uh, for your special mercy and grace. Grace right now, Father, to cover uh, me and, and my sinfulness and, and to push all that out of the way so that Jesus can be seen today in this message. I pray, Father, that truth would be uplifted as it is in Jesus. And I also pray, Father, that our hearts will be drawn closer to your Son. Father, speak through me this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. The thing about being deceived is that no one thinks they are. It's like being asleep. You don't know that you're sleeping until you wake up. You don't know that you have been deceived until you become undeceived. Does that make sense? The thought that one is believing a falsehood is a thought that very few people are thinking. Nobody wants to believe that they're wrong. I mean, I don't like being wrong. Do you like being wrong? And so the idea and the vulnerability we have to go through to admit that we're wrong, it's just plain scary. If I acknowledge I'm wrong, it could mean that my comfortable life might have to change. If I'm wrong about something I'm doing or saying or, 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 or practicing, wow, that could mean radical change for me. And usually to admit you're wrong requires something that we all could use a little bit more of, humility. And of course, if I'm wrong about one thing, it could mean I'm wrong about other things too. So it's kind of scary to talk about, you know, our beliefs and our thoughts and our opinions and be able to examine them honestly and objectively. The truth is the popular path is, it's just, it, the popular path is just simply go on believing what you already believe. It's easy. It doesn't require any transformation or reformation or re revival. Just go on believing what you want to believe is the easy road. Now, what you believe might be right, but how do you know until you examine it, willing to see if it is right? You've got to look at the evidence. And of course, for Bible believers, this is our book of evidence. This is our truth detector. We've got to be willing to examine everything we believe in the light of this book. Well, I know a lot of people who are pretty stubborn. And they refuse to examine their beliefs. They say something is true. I know it's wrong. And I try to convince them that they're wrong, but they don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. We all know people like that. But the truth is that we can be that way too. Isn't that right? Because Come on, can we be honest enough to admit that sometimes I just don't want to hear it? That's just the way we are. In doing our best to enlighten the world about truth, we become truth bearers. We run into obstacles, the hard hearts, the stubbornness, the obstinance. The Bible calls them stiff-necked people many times. I've, uh, I've had some pretty interesting encounters as I've tried to share the precious truths of the three angels, as I've tried to share the gospel of Jesus with, with, with atheists and agnostics and, and Buddhists and with Hindus and with Muslims. I, I try to share the good news and the, the, the obstacles and the walls go up and, and people have this, this thing called cognitive dissonance where they just can't believe it's true. It just it, the, the, the thought that they could possibly be wrong is not a thought they're, thought they're even willing to have. I've had conversations with people who tell me they are absolutely sure there is no absolute truth. I've had conversations with people who, who can't believe in a God who would permit evil in this world. But then they object to Christians trying to stop evil in this world. I meet Christians who say they believe in Jesus, but not the Bible. Like, come on, like, where do you get the idea of Jesus from? I mean, where do we get the main teachings of Jesus from? I believe in Jesus, but not the Bible. Doesn't make sense. But I met people like this. And you wonder what's going through people's minds. Even among ministers of the gospel, I've encountered those who teach their congregations wildly ridiculous things. One of the most strange things that I hear ministers teaching their congregations is that the Ten Commandments are no longer binding. 
The Ten Commandments are no longer mine. They, you can do whatever you want to do. You know, yes, they're, they're, they're good, strong suggestions. They're encouragements, but we cannot look at them as commandments anymore because we're not under the law. In fact, I've come to hear several different excuses for disobedience. I've come to the one, well, it's impossible to obey, so why even try? We're all sinners. God doesn't expect us to keep His commandments because it's impossible to do so. I've heard ministers teach this from the pulpit. They say, well, the Ten Commandments was given for the sole purpose to show that we're sinners, as if God doesn't have an eternal law. God only gave them to show that we're sinners. Some will say, well, the law or the commandments are only for the Jews. You've heard this one before. Somehow grace becomes an excuse for disobedience. I hear probably this is one of the most popular ones I've heard. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. They don't understand that being under the law means being under the condemnation of the law. And being under grace means you're set free to actually do what the law says. They will tell us that obeying the law brings you into bondage. That was interesting. I, I always find it very hard for me to understand that concept because it was me breaking the law that put me in bondage and got me locked up, right? So the idea that obeying the law keep, gives you free, or obeying the law brings you bondage and breaking it brings you freedom is that's where I have some cognitive dissonance. What makes it so sad is that these ministers are leading people into sin. Why, how do we know that? Because First John chapter four verse three says, "For the for sin is the what transgression of the law." So. If there is no law, if we don't have to obey no law, then there is no sin. And so by telling the people they don't have to obey the commandments, they're basically saying, you can sin. Is that what Jesus taught? I was reading, uh, in fact, this my message today is about the Sabbath, and the prayer meeting this week is also going to deal with the Sabbath a little bit in, our, um, in, in Desire of Ages. We've been going through our book, Desire of Ages. And uh, but that woman, or the, sorry, the man that was healed at the Pool of Bethesda, Jesus said, don't keep sinning or a worse thing's going to happen to you. The woman who was caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't hear a message of, neither do I condemn you. Go back to what you were doing. That's not the message that God has for us. But yet I still hear those messages from the pulpit. So it's really sad as I think about Aaron. You guys remember the story of Aaron, right? God used Aaron in a mighty way. And here Aaron and Moses brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And now as they have crossed the Red Sea, they're in the, the wilderness there right before uh, Sinai. God gave them the Ten Commandments, spoke it from the mountaintop. The people heard the commandments with their own ears. And while Moses was up into the mountain, spent 40 days receiving the Ten Commandments, the people got weary and said, hey, uh, uh, we haven't seen Moses. We haven't heard from Moses. What's going on? I mean, the cloud was still there. God's presence was still there. And yet they wanted to see Moses. And so they went to Aaron and they said, hey, Aaron, uh, what's going on? Uh, and Aaron did something completely and utterly, can I say the word ridiculous? He said, let me make you a god. He created this molten calf, and he said, this is your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. This image. And the people worshipped this golden calf. Can, I, mean, can you, I mean, right now, you're probably thinking to yourself, how in the world can somebody come to the place where God just delivered them so mightily, and now they're already in idolatry and false worship, right? How can that happen? How can... I, Aaron caused not just himself to sin, as a leader, he even was bearing more responsibility, but the children of Israel to sin. And then he began to make up excuses for his disobedience, right? Remember when Moses came down from the mountain? What did Joshua say? Um, I think there's a war going on. He's like, no, 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 that's not, a, that's not the sound of war. That's the sound of a party. These guys are celebrating. And they get down there and they're dancing, jumping around, shouting and hollering, loud music thinking they're worshiping the true God, but in fact, God was nowhere near them. They, it was false worship. At the end of the day, God wasn't having his excuses. Oh, the people came to me. They, they demanded something. I, I, I threw some gold in the fire, and out came this calf, right? Come on. 
Aaron, who are you lying to? So many people died because of Aaron's rebellion. Many people died because Aaron refused to stand tall against the pressure of the people. I'm tell, I, I just look at that story and I think, how can somebody with such position and responsibility and power come to the place where they throw it all away? Completely abandon basic principles. The very They just heard the commandments from the mountaintop. Don't make any images and bow down to them. What? People wanted falsehood so badly that they demanded it from the spiritual leader and he capitulated. He gave in. Is it any better today? Do people still, are people happy to receive truth? Do people want truth? People want something. The convenience of Christianity, but not the convictions. Regarding the law, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 through 20, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do what? To fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by in no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Notice this, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so should be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me back up real quick. Which commandment are we talking about? Which one of the ten is the least? <laughs> well, whatever you assign. It doesn't, I'm not going to put an assignment there. I don't know which one God considers to be the least. But whatever you think is the least one, it doesn't even matter. God says, whichever commandment you think may be the least, if you're telling people to break that commandment and you're teaching, you're breaking it and you're teaching people to do so, let me tell you something. Those in the kingdom are going to consider you to be the least but whoever does and teaches them, two things. What, what is God want his, what is Jesus telling his people to do? To first of all, obey the commandments. Amen. And secondly, to teach the commandments. And what about these people? These are the ones that are going to be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a salvational issue according to Jesus. Now, there is one of these commandments, as you probably are very well aware, and I just mentioned I'm going to be talking about the Sabbath today, but there's one of these commandments that many people consider to be the least of the ten. I hear this a lot. Oh, uh, those nine commandments are important, but that Sabbath one, not so important. Well, even if you consider that to be the least one, that commandment is still an important commandment. Is that fourth commandment an optional commandment? Well, amen. Sounds like a lot of good Sabbath keepers in the room. The Sabbath is absolutely important, and yet it's being taught as an optional commandment. Let me share with you about Satan attacking this commandment. And, and by the way, the reason I believe Satan attacks this commandment so much is because God's name and his title is in this commandment. You have you read the Ten Commandments, the Revelation, or sorry, Exodus chapter uh, 20, verses 8 through 11. In that commandment, you see God's name, you see his title, and you see his territory, in which is God's seal. This commandment, if kept the way God intended us to keep it, will protect your relationship with Him. God gave this commandment to be a relationship-building commandment. Of all the Ten Commandments, this commandment is, I believe, one of, the most, one of the most calculated commandments to build your relationship with Jesus. And that's why Satan attacks it so much. He hates this commandment. He does not want you to spend time with God. He does not want you to spend time in church. He does not want you to spend time in fellowship. Satan does not want you to consider spiritual things. He wants you to be distracted. He wants you to be focused on other things. Satan is busy at work attacking the Sabbath. He has always been from the very beginning. You look at the Old Testament. Satan attacked the Sabbath. He convinced God's people that it was not important. And so what did they do? They broke the Sabbath. They forgot the Sabbath. They ignored the Sabbath commandment. In the New Testament, you find Satan attacking the Sabbath differently because, you know, when they came back from uh, captivity, one of the reasons they went into captivity is because they broke the Sabbath. 
Now they're back from captivity. They said, okay, we're going to keep the Sabbath now. And they were very strict about the Sabbath. And so what they did, but they, but they went from one ditch, overcorrected right into the other ditch. And now they're keeping the Sabbath. You know what Solomon said? Do not be righteous over much. Don't be too righteous. Now, now, now they went from being disobedient and breaking the Sabbath, to now they're legalists thinking the Sabbath can save them. And then they start adding rules to the Sabbath to where the Sabbath becomes a great burden and nobody wants to keep the Sabbath. Oh, Sabbath's here again. Is it Friday? Oh, I can't keep, I can't keep doing this or that because Sabbath's here. And Sabbath became this downer and nobody wanted the Sabbath. I can't wait till Sabbath's over. Look at that. Oh, just one more hour until the Sabbath's over. That's not what God wanted. God, in fact, that, that's why he named the days of the week. Did you know God named the days of the week? The first day was actually the first day unto the Sabbath. The second day unto the Sabbath. The third day unto the Sabbath. Fourth day unto the, every day of the week reminded them that Sabbath was coming. And then the sixth day of the week was called preparation day. And then the Sabbath day itself was there all week long. They were waiting and longing for the Sabbath. That's what God wants for us. Oh no, one hour left on the Sabbath. Oh, how, what can we do to get the most special blessing out of the Sabbath as we can before the Sabbath's over? That should be the Spirit, guarding those edges of the Sabbath. But yet Satan confused the church leadership to make extra burdens on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath became a drudgery. But of course, Satan wasn't done with his attacks on the Sabbath. And so you look at church history, and what happens? What happens is, the church begins to once again forget the Sabbath, but in a different way. In the Old Testament, they just simply said, nah, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to work. I'm going to go out in the fields. I'm going to, you know, go buy and sell. You know, they did whatever. Satan was ingenious. None of us have a mind to match Satan, but praise God, Jesus has a mind to match him, right? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, the Bible says. Now, with that said, Satan infiltrates the church. He convinces people not, not to break the Sabbath directly, but he's so smart. He gets them to redefine the Sabbath so as to cause people to break it unknowingly. Now, the leadership know because they're, they're behind this, but many of the people say, oh, I'm just, I'm just following the Lord. And so by instituting this, this idea that Sunday was a new Sabbath, then all of a sudden people uh, said, okay, well, the, the, the Sabbath was for the Jews. And if you're going to keep the Sabbath and you become a Judaizer and he associated legalism with Sabbath keeping and, and all of a sudden Sabbath became a dirty word. Oh, you're not one of those who keep the Sabbath, are you? And so those in Rome and Alexandria were all Sunday keepers and the church in the East and the church in the West were all Sabbath keepers. But, but when you travel to Rome... When you're in Rome, you do as Rome does. You keep Sunday, but then the power and influence of Rome began to spread. And so all these people are now keeping Sunday as the Sabbath. They taught the people that the sanctity of the Sabbath was transferred to the first day of the week without a single Bible verse proving it. No, because the church had authority. Now, I'm not going to get into all the history of this, but I'm going to tell you something. Satan has not forgot his hatred of the Sabbath. He does not want you to spend time with God, no more than he wanted Abraham or Moses or the disciples or you or me. He does not want us to spend time with God, and so he continues to attack the Sabbath and diminish it. And so Satan in these last days is unleashing this, 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 this hellish effort to get the world to ignore this commandment. Now, it used to be that people were telling, or the church leaders were telling people that God changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. I don't hear that line of argument much anymore, and I believe the reason is, is because you guys, faithful followers of Jesus, Sabbath-keeping Christians, have been good in telling the world there's nothing in the Scriptures that supports a change in the Sabbath. And so the, the, their tactic has to change to keep people deceived. And so what has Satan been doing? He's, he's using all kinds of different uh, techniques and options, but I'll tell you, um, one thing he's been doing is convincing people that the, 
How do I put this? Okay. He's not telling people that the Sabbath has been changed. In fact, now you hear church leaders tell people, no, 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 no. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. We keep Sunday because of the resurrection. No, it's not a holy day, but it's the day of Christian gathering. Very subtle, right? But one thing I've been hearing, and this is where the, the devil really dug deep in his pocket and came out with a doozy of a deception. He begins to tell people that Jesus is our Sabbath. That Jesus is our Sabbath. As he continues to... I'm missing some slides there. Let me remind you of this. The closer deception looks like truth, the more it will convince. Let me read that again. The closer deception looks like truth the more it will convince. The more it will convince people, and the more people it will convince. Friends, the track of truth lies close beside the track of error. And for many who are not studying their Bibles and not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, it looks like the same track. We need discernment. We need to wake up. We need to dig in our Word to understand God's Word, to study the Bible. And so what do I have been hearing lately? What is the, the line of reasoning and the argument that has convinced so many is this teaching that Jesus is our Sabbath. Now I'm just going to see by showing of hands, who has heard anybody use this as an argument for not keeping the Sabbath? Anybody heard this argument before? Okay. Well, if you haven't heard this argument, I'm just telling you in a short time, you will hear it. So I'm going to meet it before you reach it. Satan wants you to, and this is how subtle this is, because what, you, what you're reading on the screen looks so nice. I mean, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound good? Oh, Jesus is our Sabbath. And we know that there's a Bible verse that says Jesus is our Passover, right? And we teach that we don't observe the Passover today because the Passover was a type and a shadow of what Jesus was to do. When Jesus came, the, pat, the shadow and type passed away. So if Jesus is our Passover, and we no longer observe the Passover because Jesus is our Passover, well, then if Jesus is the Sabbath, then why do we observe the Sabbath? It was a shadow and a type. Now, just to illustrate that this is a popular teaching, I'm going to share with you a couple of videos, a few videos, three videos, that are of some popular teachers out there today using this argument. And listen, they, they do it very convincingly. But like I said, we have to be careful to discern truth from error. Let's see if the audio works on this one here. Nope. All right, we'll try now. The Sabbath was the day of rest. All right, we're going to turn that volume Jesus up. Is our... I'll start that one over. Does anybody know who that is? Creflo Dollar. Okay. He's a, he's, Creflo Dollar is a very popular faith, uh, what do you call it, word faith movement teacher. Um, all right, see if it works The now. Sabbath was the day of rest, but today Jesus is our Sabbath. The Sabbath was a dim preview of what was to come, that you can rest in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our rest. So what he's teaching is, is that because Jesus is our Sabbath, we don't need the Sabbath anymore, which is strange to me because if Jesus is our Sabbath, but we don't need the Sabbath, then are you saying we don't need Jesus? That's kind of strange. But he's saying here that it's a dim shadow. He's saying that the Sabbath, God gave the Sabbath to point to Jesus. And then when Jesus comes, we don't need it because Jesus is the rest, that, or the only rest that we need. Is this what the Bible teaches? We're going to examine this a little closer in a second. Let's see what another teacher says. Uh, by the way, this here is John Piper. John Piper is a Reformed theologian. This guy has popularity. He's written books. This guy, many people look up to him as a respected teacher. And, and he's eloquent. And he speaks powerfully. But listen to what he says. Oops, I skipped through too fast. Let's try it again. And Christ has become our Sabbath rest. The ultimate answer to the question, where is the Sabbath? It's Christ is the Sabbath. Christ is the Sabbath. It says you want Sabbath rest? Get Jesus. You don't need to actually rest. You don't need to physically cease from your labors every seventh day on the day that God made holy. No, you've got Jesus. You don't need the Sabbath. That is the line of reasoning here. And I'll share this last one with you. This one actually is a, a question that somebody is asking uh, to Brother Frank Turek. He's a, an American apologist, again, another very popular author and public speaker, radio host. And uh, he has a very large following. 
And here's what, how he's responding to a question of um, a Bible student out in the audience. One is the Sabbath, if uh -huh. the, why it's not recognized on Saturday instead of Sunday. Uh -huh. And if it's uh, commanded by God and not by man, then why would they change it to Sunday? Out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament. The only one that isn't is keep holy the Sabbath. Why? Because well, what did the Sabbath represent? It represented rest. And who is our rest? Jesus. Jesus is our rest. Okay. So the Sabbath command does not apply anymore. So the Sabbath command does not apply anymore. Why? Because Jesus is our rest. That's what he's saying. First of all, let me just address his other claim that of the Ten Commandments, the only one not repeated in the New Testament is the Sabbath commandment. That is totally false. In fact, of the Ten Commandments, the only one not repeated is the Third Commandment, which says don't take God's name in vain. You won't find that anywhere in the New Testament. The Sabbath commandment is mentioned more than any of the other commandments combined. So that's a completely false statement on his part. But addressing his, his, his claim that because Jesus is our rest, Jesus is our Sabbath, therefore the Sabbath does not apply anymore, this line of reasoning has convinced a lot of people to simply dismiss the Sabbath as optional, if not completely uh, unbiblical. And I don't think that is right. And I'm just telling you that this line of thought is very attractive. I mean, why obey a commandment that inconveniences me when I could just say I love Jesus and that's that? We need to have an answer when this argument is brought up. Um, and I think the, the, several of these, as they were sharing these thoughts, they were, they were pulling some of these thoughts from the book of Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to encourage you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to take a brief look at this and see if there's any legitimacy to this idea that Jesus is our Sabbath. Hebrews chapter 4. If you're familiar with Hebrews here, of course it was written to the Hebrews, and the Apostle Paul and perhaps other writers with him are writing to the Hebrews and using the illustration of the wilderness experience to bring to their attention a great need to find rest in Jesus. So let's look here. Actually, you can, if you want to read it in context, you can go back and begin in chapter 3, beginning around verse 12 and on. But I'm going to look here, beginning in verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest... So I'm going to get the error was on the screen. Since therefore a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. By the way, who, who is them? That's the church of the wilderness. Did they hear the gospel? Absolutely. So be sure to understand that the gospel was preached in the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Verse 3. For we who have believed, do enter that rest. What is he talking about? The believers enter that rest? As he said, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God was angry at their disobedience, so they did not enter that rest. Now, verse it goes on to say, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what, what is he bringing our mind back to? The foundation of the world. The, the works that he did was what? The first six days of creation. He finished it, and then he brought in a day of rest, right? Verse 4, for he had spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the seventh day Sabbath, right? And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. So what are we talking about? We're talking about keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy. Those who are keeping the seventh-day Sabbath holy are entering into God's rest. But the only way you can do that is through faith. Let me make a strong statement here. If you are resting on the seventh day of the week, but you don't have faith, you're not keeping the Sabbath. True Sabbath-keeping only comes when you have faith in our Lord and belief and by the way, that's a faith that leads to obedience because you'll notice here in just a second that their lack of faith led to disobedience. In fact, it's really interesting. You see the Greek here. The word unbelief and disobedience is the same word. Unbelief and disobedience is the exact same Greek word. Look here at verse 6. 
Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And by the way, we know those stories in uh, like Exodus chapter 16, where God gave them a test regarding the Sabbath, and then they went out and picked up sticks on the Sabbath anyway. And God got angry, didn't he? He got upset. He said, how long do you refuse to obey my commandments and my laws? They did not enter in because of disobedience. Again, he designated a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time, it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua, if you read the King James Version, it says Jesus, but that Jesus is the same Hebrew word as Joshua, so don't be confused. It's talking about the Joshua who came after Moses. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There, no, you please don't miss verse 9 and 10. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. By the way, that word rest there in the Greek is sabbatismos. And it means the keeping of the Sabbath. There remains, therefore, a keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. For he who entered his rest, is that what you want? Do you want to enter into Jesus' rest? Do you want to enter into God's rest? Notice this, also ceased from his works as God did from his. I'll make some things clear here real quick. Hebrews chapter 4 does not paint the Sabbath as a type or shadow of Jesus. What the Sabbath is in this passage is an illustration of the rest that God wants to bring to us. Not a shadow or a type that comes to an end. You know, a type or shadow uh, somehow... In, you know, implies that it's going to be done away with. The shadow is going to meet the substance. When, die, when Christ died as a sacrificial lamb and the curtain was ripped in two, no longer were we to offer lambs. They wouldn't represent Jesus anymore. But the, but the Sabbath was not given because of sin. The Sabbath was not given to deal with sin or to shadow or ty typify Christ. Notice this, guys. Very important to understand this. The Sabbath was given where? In the Garden of Eden before sin happened. Now, God knew sin would come, but sin had not taken place yet. The, there, there's, uh, Paul talks about the law that was added because of transgressions. That law was the ceremonial law, the temple law, the, the law of sacrifices and offerings. The Sabbath commandment was not part of that law. That was a moral commandment of God, an eternal commandment. Notice this verse right here, Hebrew, or Psalm uh, 119 and 160. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures how long? Forever. This was not a temporary law. This is an eternal law, including the Sabbath. Marriage was also, by the way, given in the Garden of Eden. Right? It doesn't typify or shadow the, the crucifixion of Jesus or the ministry of him in the heavenly sanctuary. So let's be clear. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who gave this day as a gift to mankind, as Sister Tammy read earlier from Mark chapter 2, 27 and 28. He says the Sabbath was made for who? Man. doesn't say Jew. It says it was made for man, which means mankind, anthropos, for, and not man for the Sabbath. It is a gift to humanity. Notice this. He says, therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath, that is the Lord's day. So let's not lower our Creator to be part of His creation. You understand? Yes, the creation can help illustrate the Creator, but let's not make Jesus into the Sabbath. That is a very unbiblical statement. As good as the Sabbath is, it is not our Savior. And let me add to those who think the Sabbath will save you. The Sabbath will not save you. Keeping the Sabbath doesn't make you holy. Holy people keep the Sabbath. There's a difference. The Sabbath doesn't save anybody. No more than honoring your mother or father saves you. It just doesn't do that. You do that because you love your mother and father. It's because you love the Lord. So don't miss this, friends. The Sabbath is special. It's a sign, in fact. When a believer keeps the Sabbath, he acknowledges that the saving work of Christ. And this is what Hebrews 4 is talking about. That we cease from our own works. Our works cannot save us. The Sabbath illustrates that we cannot work our way to heaven. 
The Sabbath shows us that we must rest in Christ alone. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, speak also to the children of Israel, which by the way, you are modern Israel. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are Israel indeed. Spiritual Israel, Hebrew or Revel, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. You are spiritual Jews. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord, who does what? Sanctifies you. This is a sign of God's sanctification, the conversion experience that we go through. If God can make a day holy, He can make you holy. That's what the Sabbath is a sign of. It's a sign that God saves us. And we cannot save ourselves. Hebrews 4 shows us that unbelief and disobedience will prevent us from experiencing God's ultimate rest. Now, the Israelites during their exodus from Egypt, they could have experienced spiritual rest and grace if they only believed, right? That's what we just read here in Hebrews chapter 4. They could have had it. The gospel was preached. It was available. They had the gospel. They had the new covenant experience available to them. Even Moses preached the new covenant about them having a new heart, about them having the law written on the heart. Salvation by grace was available to them. And that's what the Sabbath demonstrates. It's a weekly sign. Please understand this. The Sabbath is a weekly sign that we are saved by grace, by, putting, by resting in Jesus. But also understand this, that the sign of salvation by works will be found in a substitute Sabbath. A counterfeit Sabbath put in place by humans. You see, when people determine to set aside the law of God and keep a day of their own choosing, they're not truly resting in grace, but they're attempting to be saved by their own works. They're substituting man's word for God's word. It comes down to choosing his way or our way. Satan tempted Aaron to present an idol as a counterfeit way to worship God. And you know, we marvel that almost all Israel fell for it. Praise God for the Levites. Almost all Israel fell for this deception to worship this idol. And so today, people marvel. Say, how, can the, how can so many people be wrong? Now, you have 12 tribes. One tribe stood tall. The rest of them bowed down. That, is that the majority or the minority? The majority bowed down. Could it be that in this day today, the majority have it wrong? Amen. It's true. Religious leaders have counterfeited the Sabbath and replaced an idle Sabbath and has convinced the entire religious world that Sunday is the holy day or the day of Christian gathering and that the Sabbath is a day that's just as common as anything else. Friends, we must be careful not to be deceived by attractive arguments and beautiful deceptions. Understand that 99% truth is 100% error. So no, Jesus is not the Sabbath. But He is the giver of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Yes, we find our rest in Jesus. The Sabbath is the gift to help us find that rest in Him. I think it's like a little bit like baptism, right? We're baptized into Christ, and yet Jesus isn't our baptism. We don't, you don't hear Christians saying, well, I don't need to get baptized because Jesus is my baptism. Does that make sense? <laughs> you see, baptism is a sign of our commitment to Him. It's a public pledge and a sign that we are serving the risen Savior. And so the Sabbath is a weekly reminder and a sign that, we, that God is our Creator, right? The Sabbath is a weekly sign that God's our creator and our savior. Both institutions, baptism and the Sabbath, tell the world who we serve. Baptism at the beginning of our journey, the Sabbath for the rest of our journey. The Sabbath is a sign. Baptism is a sign. Let's not try to replace the signs that God has given us. The banners that we wave and say, I'm a follower of the true God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth. So Hebrews 4, instead of telling us that Jesus is the Sabbath, or that the Sabbath is Jesus, <laughs> instead it tells us that there remains a Sabbath rest to the people of God who have faith in Jesus. Friends, we can rest 
every seventh day. We can lay aside our labors. There's a lot of people in the world who do that. But to truly keep the Sabbath, we must find our rest in Christ. Didn't Jesus say there in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 11, verse 28, I believe, through 30, Come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to give us rest. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. I got a scripture here. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. Jesus did not come to do away with the Sabbath or to, or to just dismiss the Sabbath or to diminish it. In any way, he came to exalt it. He came to make it honorable. Every Sabbath is to be a taste of that eternal rest that God has made man originally in the garden to experience. God made man to live forever. He wants him to have that forever rest. And friends, we are going to have that if we find Jesus. And by the way, just like God wanted Adam to have it in the garden, he taught it throughout church history, we're going to have it again. Isaiah 66, we're going to have it in heaven. Every Sabbath, we're going to come and worship God. So is Jesus our Sabbath? Even better, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the giver of rest to us. And I hope you found that rest, friends. I hope you've experienced that peace. I hope the Sabbath for you is not just, and, and by the way, this is something, you know, they say familiarity breeds contempt. If you've been keeping the Sabbath more than a couple of years, there's a temptation that the Sabbath has become a dry, boring ritual to you, just the same as the Pharisees had. Freshen it up. That day is a day when God draws close to his people. There's a supernatural rest and blessing he wants to give to us on that day. May you have a fresh experience with Jesus this Sabbath and every Sabbath going forward. I pray that you've experienced the faith that the children of Israel did not have in the wilderness, that you have that faith so you can enter into his rest. I like the Bible verse here. still in Hebrews 4. He says, labor to enter into that rest. God wants us to labor, friends, to work hard to find that rest in Jesus. Don't let anything stand in your way. Work out your own salvation, the Bible says, Philippians 2, I believe, with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Would you choose with me today to commit to lay aside your burdens and commit fully and entirely in the righteousness of Christ and to experience the true rest that he wants you to have. Anybody want to commit with me today to enter into his rest? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to experience that rest. Forgive me, Father, for all the times on your holy day that I've let secular things crowded, crowd you out. I've let the busyness of life keep me from hearing your voice. Forgive me, Father, for not enjoying the pleasure of your company more than anything else on the Sabbath. I pray, God, that we would experience the rest that's in Christ, that if anybody has come today to your house that is carrying burdens, that they can lay it aside today and find that hope, that help, that health through Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your precious promises that we can enter your rest, and we do long and look forward to that day where we will forever be with you in your presence and we'll come and gather every Sabbath in your holy city on your holy day to worship you, our King, our Creator, and our Redeemer. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.